Um, so good evening and thank you. Thank you so much for joining. I know we're all hitting various levels of fatigue and Zoom fatigue is one. Although on the other hand, it's kind of nice to just log on when it's time to do it and log off when you're gone. You don't have to worry about parking or um, you know, travel time, anything like that, traffic. So I am Dr. Miranda Wiley. I'm a naturopathic physician in Vancouver, British Columbia. And I have been asked to talk to you guys tonight about immune support using Manuka honey, which is this really wonderful, wonderful honey that we are about to discuss. So today's topics, it looks like a lot. They're all, you know, little bite-sized chunks. So we're gonna go through the historical use of honey. What is Manuka honey compared to the other honeys? MGO, the magic Manuka honey ingredient, some antimicrobial properties, and then the next we all kind of run together, using it in various immune support needs, colds and flus, gastrointestinal health, wound healing, where's the research? Um, why are we doing this? What, what proof do we have? Who is Manuka Health? So the company that is sponsored tonight's talk, um, NGO and UMF ratings, there's a lot of letters we'll be throwing out. I'll clarify what those means. Using Manuka Honey for kids, how to choose which strength because there's a variety of them on the shelf and it's gonna be a little overwhelming if you're not familiar with the honey. Like, which one do I pick? There's a big price range difference as well. And then quickly touch on the lozenges. And then I'll be here for any questions. So again, numbers are still going up, really love this. So if anyone has any questions, please pop them in the Q&A or in the chat. I will get to them at the end. Otherwise it can be a little bit um, disjointed as I try to juggle too many things. So honey is sort of about as old as humankind in terms of our use of it. There is evidence that humans may have raided wild honeybees nests during the stone age. There was no sugar back then. It was like tiny little berries for a week or two in summer. And most of them were pretty tart. So this human drive for sweetness um, means we would brave dealing with, with honeybees. So here we have a hive in a hollow log hive. So little hives in a bigger hive um, from France in Savenne. And that reveals the details of the circular comb architecture that our ancient humans, our ancestors, would have discovered. And that's being featured in the Smithsonian. Then we can also trace that to ancient Egypt. So 2,000, 2,500 years uh, BC. Here we have Abu Sir, the house of the Temple of Osiris, north of Memphis and Saqqara uh, in the south of Cairo. And there's ancient African bees, depiction of these honey sticks. So it kind of looks like these ones, these long tubular hives that would have um, you know, nestled into to crevices. Uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that some temple name. And then so that was found in the, the fifth dynasty of Egypt, this particular demarcation with these pictures of the bees. And then in Europe, so 700, 600 years ago, um, we had the traditional sort of cone-shaped honeybees. We've been using them for about as long as we've been walking around and seeking out our relationship with nature. Manuka honey in particular is a very unique honey and it all comes down to the Manuka tree itself. This is a relative of tea tree. It grows in New Zealand. Um, the Latin name is Leptospermum scoparium, and it's traditionally been used, the tree itself. So sort of like tea tree oil that you would get to put on you know, cuts and abrasions. The Manuka tree has also been used as a remedy for skin, for digestive health, mouth, throat ailments. So we see so that parallel in immune function in these closely related trees. The Manuka tree only flowers for a few weeks a year, so you've got about six to eight weeks, not atypical for, for trees to have blossoms for you know, only a month or two. And that's when the bees go around and they are specifically going in and collecting the pollen from the Manuka blossoms that then gets transformed into the Manuka honey. Genuine Manuka honey only comes from New Zealand. So that's your first step when you're looking at any Manuka honey product on the shelf, just confirm product of New Zealand. Already that's a, a really great quick screening tool. All Manuka honey is exported from New Zealand. It has to pass strict government standards. So this is a bit of a national treasure in New Zealand and they're really sort of guarded on making sure that people are getting the quality that they're um, appreciating true Manuka honey and not a cheap knockoff that is just going to uh, line someone's pockets. And Manuka honey is really special. So honeys in general have been used, you know, for sweetness for as long as we've known, but they're also really, really great medicinal aids. So if you're in the kitchen and you burn yourself, not a bad idea to reach for any honey that you have, put it directly on the wound um, and it can encourage the healing. A lot of that comes down to hydrogen peroxide that is present in the honey. For Manuka, if they expose it to an enzyme that breaks down hydrogen peroxide, we still see really strong antibacterial activity. 
So it is not just dependent on the hydrogen peroxide that is found in honey as a general rule. This is the very first honey to be really, really extensively researched, recognized by scientists and medical experts for its remarkable therapeutic properties. So, you know, looking at the indigenous people, the Maori using it and going like, wow, there's something really more than this than your average clover honey or acacia honey. They, they seem to be getting really more powerful results. Let's put it in the lab. Let's run it through some tests, find out why. And is it just our perception or is there actually something there? And that antibacterial activity is unique as it's stable and long lasting, therefore not hydrogen peroxide, which does generally break down into oxygen and water. And research has shown that when it's applied tropically, we have even more specific antibacterial and anti-inflammatory properties and speeds wound healing. So it's honey plus, honey plus all that added benefit of the Manuka tree itself. And that comes down to MGO. So this is methyl glyoxal and is the active ingredient in Manuka honey. So years of scientific investigation, you know, they, they take it, they break things down, find the different components, study this, study that, take that, break it down and get a little bit more narrowed in. So methyl glyoxal is one particular compound that is responsible for Manuka's superior act antibacterial activity. 2008, so 14 years ago, Manuka Health, this particular company, pioneered MGO testing so that when you're buying Manuka honey, I think of it as like kind of, you know, driving up to a gas station. Are you putting in, um, you know, regular, are you putting in premium? And so if you're buying Manuka honey, we want to know, are you getting, you know, the good stuff that's worth all that money? Or are you getting something that's a little bit more diluted and maybe not um, as much bang for the buck? In which case, you know, we need to know why we're using it and what that degree of MGO is. So Manuka Health pioneered that MGO testing so they can grade their honeys and be much more specific so people, the consumer, knows what they're getting and why they're getting it. And it's a pretty clear linear thing. So here we have the antibacterial activity. So take a um, Petri dish, grow microbes on it, add the methyl glyoxal and see how much they kill. And as the concentration of methyl glyoxal goes up, the ability to kill bacteria goes up. So it's very clear that this is the active compound in there. Um, so we see that the higher level of methyl glyoxal, the higher the antibacterial activity, these cute little um, graphs there. And that is because it's formed from DHA, this is um, dihydroacetone. So it's a compound that is found in the Manuka nectar. So again, we're coming to that tree, pulling out the DHA, the bees are collecting that. DHA doesn't have a lot of antimicrobial activity, but as the honey ripens, as it ages, MGO increases. So it's just, it's being formed through enzymatic reactions. So in order to encourage that to happen from the, um, the beehive through to that final product, there's temperature control. We'll go through a little sort of um, step-by-step grid and graph that takes us through how they do this and really maximize the MGO content that's in there. Testing every batch. So they test everything and we'll get to a whole slide that discusses their, their testing and how you can know for sure you can get your guarantee there. And then certifying the methyl glyoxal content on the product label is that for your customer, for you, your quality and grade assurance. So you know that you're spending your money in the right place. So antimicrobial properties. So there's quite a few studies that have been done. This one looked at the inhibitory effect of Manuka honey shown in over 60 different bacteria species. So here we have a summary of seven of them. If we look at how much the microbes are able to grow, Pink one is the Manuka honey, so it's suppressing the growth the most of all of them. The green one is pasture honey. So this is your acacia, your clover, your wildflower. So they are still antimicrobial, absolutely. Uh, but we're seeing a little bit of superior antimicrobial effect from the Manuka, particularly if we look at things like E. coli, a bit more of a stark difference there. Um, Methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, a little bit more on par, but Manuka gets a bit of an edge. Artificial honey is sugar syrup, probably, you know, corn and they take half of it, they convert that into fructose. Now they've made a synthetic honey, which is what they're gonna to use to flavor like honey flavored cereals or honey salad dressing. So it, it's not gonna have that medicinal benefit. It really is just a glucose fructose blend. So some of the specific bacteria, um, E. coli. So we see that one here. So this is like bladder infections, gut infections, enterobacter erogenes. So we're seeing um, again, we're sort of gut salmonella gut, staph aureus skin. So especially when you get that sort of yellowy, greeny, crusty stuff showing up on top of the scab, that usually indicates a staph aureus infection. Aureus being gold, so you see that golden crust. And then lab studies are revealing that it's also effective against methicillin-resistant staph aureus. This is the scary one, this is your flesh-cheating disease. 
beta hemolytic streptococci. Um, so like the bad strep, we all have staph and strep living in and on us. We just don't want these guys. These are the, the bad eggs, the, the, the problems, like the, the bad people in our society. Most of us are good. We do have some that make the news. These are the guys that make the news. And then vancomycin resistant enterococci. So if we're looking at um, a lot of skin infections and those microbes are becoming resistant to the antibiotics that are used to treat them, so far to date, there's no antibiotic resistance that has been found against honey. So honey is just this nice universal, it's, sort of, it's keeping a door open. Um, so at least when it comes to some skin infections, we don't need to be totally terrified of the superbugs. We should be appropriately concerned, um, but hopefully Manuka honey can help balance that out. Using it for colds and flus, again, honey in general, right? You start feeling sick, nice hot water, squeeze of lemon, put in some honey, put in maybe some fresh ginger or, or decoct the ginger for a little bit. You know, we can make our nice warm teas that help us get through a cold and a flu. Honey really soothing on the throat. And again, we have an antibacterial property, partly from the hydrogen peroxide. With Manuka, we're getting that additional from the MGO. So we're seeing some modern research starting to confirm that it's not just because it's sweet and yummy and you know feel comforting when we're feeling sick. It's actually superior to usual care for the improvement of symptoms of upper respiratory tract infections. Our instincts are right. Our ancestors were drawn to this and repeated doing it um, because it actually worked. Our results show that honey in general, and particularly Manuka honey, has potent inhibitory activity against the influenza virus. So it's one study that came out in 2014. And another study from 2014, our results show that MGO has potent inhibitory activity against influenza viruses. So this one is looking at Manuka honey in general. Um, this one is uh, getting a bit more specific into that MGO compound, which is found in the Manuka honey. Um, so it, it's not you know, uh, substance B or X or something else that we have yet to, to determine. So with Manuka honey in particular, it works best when it's in direct contact with the affected tissue. So great for a sore throat, um, great for acne, I put, um, I put on cold sores if I get that wound. Certainly it's sticky. It's not one I like put on and then I go out and run some errands or go pick up my kids from the playground. It's like, it's around the house. Um, for acne as well, it'd be like, you, know, you do it as a mask, leave it on and then rinse it off because like, it's gonna pick up every little thing that uh, is floating around. For gastrointestinal health, and this is sort of the, the cornerstone of my practice. So this is where I find it most exciting. Five isolates of H. pylori. So this is the bacteria that lives um, in our stomach. Again, many of us have it uh, and it's not a problem. For some people, H. pylori goes a little bit awry and it really starts to erode the stomach lining and it leads to gastric ulcers. So H. pylori, if you do have signs of GERD or um, gastroesophageal reflux disease, um, if you have you know, any sort of like chronic heartburn, you're probably gonna get tested for H. pylori. And it was sensitive, the five isolates of H. pylori was sensitive to a 20% solution of Manuka honey in an agar well diffusion assay. So the, the studies are there. So, and again, it's upper GI. We want the honey to come into contact with the affected tissue. So not so helpful for, you know, lesions in the, the colon because it's gonna be metabolized and broken down and, you know, degraded by our enzymes. But in the upper, so the, the throat, the upper digestive tract, we have a lot more benefit. Manuka honey is a potent anti-typhoid activity in vivo. Um, Typhoid is not something we hear about or worry about these days, but it is still present uh, in some countries. Um, and then this UMF. So sort of make, make note of that UMF of 25% was great against typhoid. And we're going to explain what that means in a few slides. It's antioxidant and anti-inflammatory. Manuka honey significantly decreased the ulcer index, completely protected the mucosa from lesions, and preserved gastric mucosal glycoprotein. Uh, so essentially really supportive and healing for that upper digestive tract, um, just having that manuka honey to really heal things up. Effective as a treatment for chronic ulcer and preservation of mucosal glycoproteins. So the mucosal is like the inside of our mouth. It's that um, soft tissue. It doesn't have the water resistant coating that the rest of us does, all that keratin layer. So it's, it's where things dry out. So all the way down our digestive canal is mucosal tissue. And glycoproteins are a sugar protein blend that have um, different effects in sort of stabilizing the area, working with the immune system. So we want to preserve them. They're a big part of how that tissue functions. So treatment, treatment of chronic ulcers, preservation of those glycoproteins, its effects are due to the antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties, soothing the burn inside. 
So aloe on a sunburn on our skin, Manuka to heal up the upper GI and uh, respiratory tract. And also great for digestive health if we're looking at it as a probiotic or sorry, as a prebiotic because it will break down and feed those microbes that are part of our microbiome. So specifically promoting the growth of the lactobacilli and the bifidobacteria, bifidobacteria. Ooh, tongue twisty. So using it for wound healing, again, this is historical, you know, when in doubt, our ancestors, you know, would put honey on, it's directly antibacterial. It also is really nice at keeping a bandage in place. So that then pre prevents the secondary infections from airborne bacteria landing on it. So it helps to really guard that area. The use of honey leads to improved wound healing in acute cases, pain relief in burn patients, and decreased inflammatory response in such patients. So again, great thing to have in the kitchen. I mean, if I could show you, my wrists are just covered in burn marks. I really should get some better gloves. Um, Manuka type honeys showed significantly higher anti-biofilm activity than clover honey and an isotonic sugar solution. So biofilm, think of our bodies, we are surrounded in life. We are a big planet, you know, we are our own sort of ecosystem and we have bacteria living all over us. Different ones inhabit our skin, then inhabit the inside of our mouth because moist versus dry. Different ones inhabit the esophagus, a little bit more acidic, more movement, stomach, respiratory tract, all throughout our system. But we have this layer of bacteria. And these microbes are a community and they work together and they put out um, shelters. They create e systems for themselves. It's the biofilms. They're, they're putting out little polysaccharides, little starches that create sort of like a housing and then they're safe underneath. So they preserve their environment. So you know, if we um, play in the dirt and it's rough and abrasive, they are a little bit protected. We're not completely scouring them away. If we go to get a blood draw, they're you know, going to rub that alcohol swab on for a while to really try and break through the biofilm, clear the area, get the needle in, and then those microbes are going to start going back. Um, hand washing, you know, 20 seconds or singing the happy birthday song or whatever it is, because there's that quick little rinse under the sink you know, it'll get off some of the, the bigger particles of dirt, but that biofilm protects. And if there's germs nestling in there, we really need to be sort of scrubbing them down and letting our own good bacteria replenish. So not antibacterial soaps, but just agitation, lots of water. Um, so the Manuka type honeys, significantly anti, sorry, significantly higher anti-biofilm activity than clover honey. And again, that isotonic sugar solution. So essentially just like, well, is it just that it's, you know, sugary is, is that the only thing that's really having that antibacterial effect what's so unique about honey it's sweet is it the sweetness that's stopping these infections it's not um and we observed higher antibiofilm activity as the proportion of manuka derived honey and thus the methyl glyoxal or mgo in a honey blend increased we're seeing more and more um antimicrobial effects boom, boom, boom. So Manuka honey in our other areas of research, we can use it for oral health. So again, it needs to come into contact. So if you have an, a wound in your mouth or you just had, uh, I don't know if dentists would appreciate me saying this. Um, if you just had some dental work done, get that antibacterial, brush your teeth again at night, but good to get that antimicrobial effect in there. So Manuka has been shown to decrease the bacteria that are associated with plaque formation, tooth decay, and gum disease. You just don't want to you know, have a big spoonful of Manuka honey, go straight to bed and and let the, the sugars, because the MGO will get used up, and then we're just leaving the sugar content behind. But throughout the day, if you're having that nice warm cup or just um, you know, a spoonful in the mouth, you are protecting your oral health and the upper GI. Skin care, so again, that topical use, it needs to come into contact. Anti-inflammatory, antibacterial. So right there, that's like your acne picture. Um, Anti-inflammatory, also looking at eczema, psoriasis. Antioxidant, so helping to heal damaged tissue. So you've been scratching for a while, or if there's been a cut or some trauma there from um, bacteria. Emollient, so moisturizing and soothing and humectant means it's trapping moisture. So again, that really sort of dry skin picture, the psoriasis, that flaking, decrease the inflammation, draw the moisture in so it can help to soothe, hydrate, protect, and heal the skin. So particularly beneficial for dry problem skin, including acne and eczema. And then nutrition, right? We are drawn to sweet things, better to get it from a good clean honey with some medicinal benefits than from high fructose corn syrup, um, right? We want all those whole food nutritional benefits. So we're getting into now the Manuka 
process itself. So here we have some very experienced beekeepers, a growing team of dedicated beekeepers. I mean, you're living in this environment. How hard would that be? We've got these, you know, their little um, tents and cabins down here, but then, you know, they go out and they'll collect from local beehives in this area. Just beautiful. So they're focusing on producing top quality Manuka honey. So they're concentrating on the hive health and the nutrition. So making sure that the bees are well looked after. If it's a bad season and they don't have enough sugar, then they can help you know, support the bees. If there's you know, local you know, environmental catastrophic things and trees are knocked down, they, they, there's humans there to help the bees in this area. Wintering programs, so keeping the hives protected and monitors when they're not busy making honey. No antibiotics are ever used on the hives. It's not necessary. Bees also produce this wonderful compound called propolis that is greatly antibacterial, antimicrobial. It's sticky, it's like a resin. Um, so any microbes just get trapped in it and can't really propagate. So beehives, for all that they are warm and moist and kind of the perfect breeding ground for bacteria, tend to be very, very, very sterile, very low bacterial count because of that propolis. There's no need to add the antibiotics. Um, but just kind of a nice peace of mind to know that they aren't doing that. And they're coming from remote, pristine environments. So very little risk of herbicides, right? Nothing's being grown up here where they're going to be spraying the crops. Um, and herbicides and pesticides are contributing to mass pollinator death, and you know, specifically the bees, but butterflies and um, other pollinators as well. So Manuka honey, their Manuka honey is also tested for herbicides and pesticides. It's not going like, hey, look, there's no herbicides and pesticides here. When they harvest it, they actually do check, checking for any other contaminants, making sure no mold spores got in there from the local environment. Um, and now they're also checking that it's genetically non-GMO. Again, it shouldn't be. There shouldn't be any GMO crops growing up here, but bees do travel. Um, seeds travel. Wind carries you know, pollens and spores all over the place. So now it's non-GMO verified. From hive to jar, we have 20,000 of their own hives, and they're located. So Manuka, Health hives are these green ones distributed over the North Island, joint venture hives. So they get about 30% of um, their Manuka honey from the hives that they own and they manage. They get about 30% from joint venture hives. So working with other people who are also um, processing Manuka. And then as needed, they'll get the other 30%, sorry, 33 for all of them, about a third um, from like spot markets. So if, if there's a bad crop, then they're able to at least purchase from other people test the quality and therefore sort of maintain their their cost they're not hey we had a really bad season in new zealand and now the prices are going to triple they're okay they can fill in those gaps from some of their other suppliers and beekeepers using really advanced technology to manage and track hives and so we're going to get into the gis bloom monitoring app in a few more slides sourced from remote dense manuka bush helicopters to access the most remote sites right so like there's nothing growing out there just bees and these beautiful trees. And that full traceability from beekeeper to jar. So for that traceability, so Oratane is um, a group that is protecting the authenticity of the honey. So honey is naturally absorbing different chemical elements, different isotopes, different compounds that are found in the pollen in the air. Again, we're looking at sort of um, climactic drift of things and they can see where things go. So you can get a really unique snapshot of what happens at each hive and how they're all slightly different. Oratane tests those honey and stores that fingerprint in their database. Then, so they have this mass database of where the different honeys are coming from, which hive, North Island, South Island, um, and where in particular. The samples are collected from the market and tested to verify origins. They go through and they'll just, you know, randomly go buy some Manuka honeys on the shelf and check that it still goes against and matches with that, um, that Oratane database. So they're confirming any origin and suspected counterfeit. So you'll see that on the pack and above uh, the line communication of Oratane testing, they're going to get less fraudulent counter, uh, less, sorry, less fraudulent products being produced because Manuka honey is expensive. And if I wanted to make a ton of money and I wasn't a very nice person and kind of corrupt, it would be really easy just to like buy some nice dark jars, get some honey, manipulate the flavor, put that label on it and charge, you know, 30 bucks, 50 bucks, 80 bucks, depending on the, the quality. So we can look at these trust codes. There's QR codes on top of the jar and every jar has its own unique QR code. So if you buy a Manuka honey, you can take your phone, scan it. Well, you can't see my phone. Whoa, there you go. Weird things. So you take your phone, you scan that QR code and you will get that um, 
tracking. So you'll get additional marketing info. It'll tell you which hive it came from. So you can get really specific and we you know, ooh, the one I'm eating came from over here. Um, but if they ever have like one QR code that has been scanned, you know, 50 times, 100 times, then they know that that QR code was copied, put on other labels, that was counterfeit. And now they can isolate where that was and go in and, and crack things down. I don't know how often this happens. If there is, you know, counterfeit, it's nice to have that um, sort of safety net in place, but I'm actually going to write myself a note um, to see, you know, how often do they come up with counterfeiters and cracking that down? So they'll collect the location of the scan, the number of scans, and how many other scans that consumer has made. So if one QR code scanned too many times, they're alerted that there might be a counterfeit out there, and they can go protect you, the consumer, and ensure that you're getting the medicinal benefit. Okay, so different Manuka Health honeys. Five of them on the shelf, and which one do you get and why, and what's all the difference? We'll start over here. This is the multi-floral Manuka honey. The bees are not particularly loyal to one tree. They're going to go wherever there's pretty flowers, and they're going to collect the pollen and move around. So with the multi-floral, these bees have visited a Manuka tree and collected some pollen. They've also been to other shrubs and plants and flowers in the area and collect those pollens as well. So the MGO, the methyl glyoxal content is only 30. And that's, that means it's 30 milligrams per kilogram of, of honey. So they're looking at all these other compounds in there and assessing, you know, what are the levels, if it's too high, if it's too low. So looking at a combination of five attributes, four different chemicals and one DNA marker, doing a DNA test, um, in order required to authenticate monofloral and multifloral monuca honey. On the monofloral sides, you know, it's the, it's the peak of uh, Manuka blossom season. The bees are, you know, filling their boots. They're getting so much Manuka pollen. They don't, aren't really branching out to the other flowers. This one, I think would be sort of earlier in the season and later in the season. Right? The blossoms are just starting and then fading away. And there's plenty of other things to choose from. These would be sort of that height of the season when it's really just Manuka, Manuka everywhere. And they're specifically collecting from those, um, those blossoms. And so Here's where you get to start throwing some fun letters at you. MPI is the Ministry for Primary. Oh, I've forgotten it. I just reviewed it like an hour ago. Ministry for Primary Industry. Um, that is from New Zealand. So this is one of their main industries. This is, you know, unique to their country. They're really sort of guarding it. So MPI governs that anything that is sold as Manuka honey truly comes from New Zealand. That's it. The UMF is a separate organization. They're the Unique Manuka Factor Honey Organization uh, Association. And so that's the UMF, Unique Manuka Factor. And they're testing each batch for three specific parameters. HMF is a quality. If it goes too high, that means that that honey was probably adulterated or it's been really heated up and it's killed off a lot of the good stuff. So we want to see this line nice and low, no higher than 40. Leptosperum, do you remember the Latin name of Manuka is Leptospermum? Um, so this is a pass. Is this truly Manuka? Yes, we want to have it be at least 100. And then the MGO is that grading test, and it's the only one that varies. So we'll see, you know, a, a UMF of five has an MGO of uh, like maybe 30 or 50, and a UMF of 16 has an MGO of approaching 600. So it, it varies. As we, the MGO content goes up, the UMF rating goes up. So there's two sort of numbers we can look at to get that confidence that we are getting a truly medicinal honey. So MGO is the one critical factor in UMF testing that determines its potency. So if you don't see MGO on the label, it didn't go through UMF testing. And so what do these numbers mean? It's looking directly at the amount of MGO in that product. So the MGO 30, you've got 30 milligrams of MGO per kilogram of honey. So it's pretty mild, good nutritious honey. You're still going to get a little bit of additional antimicrobial effect. 115, you're getting at least 115 um, milligrams per kilogram. And so that gives it a UMF equivalent of six. So just to see, the higher the number goes, the more medicinal. There's another factor that is sometimes used by other companies, which is not related to UMF. So you might see something, it won't have an MGO, it won't have a UMF, it'll say what their K factor is. But that is not a recognized um, assessment. So again, I'm coming back to a gas station. You go into a gas station and you know what kind of octane you want. And like, no, we only have, you know, we have our purple grade, our green grade, and our blue grade. And like, which one's better? Like, well, the purple one's the most expensive. It's the best. And like, okay, so how does that compare to like a high octane? Like, what's the percentage? Like, oh yeah, we, we don't use those numbers. 
is it's it's just they're completely coming up with their their own sort of grading system which doesn't match the research that's been done. So K factor is used by some companies. It's not used by Manuka Health um, because it's not uh, an indicator of potency. It doesn't tell us anything. It really just looks at the pollen count in the Manuka honey, which is nothing to um, determine or guarantee the antibacterial property. So Manuka Health's process, they get their honey boxes from their extraction, the hives, the frames are spun, the honey is extracted from the frames, the drums are tested for quality before arriving on site. So while they're still remote, check for quality, that's good. Then it arrives at the warehouse, check for quality again, still good. Put it into a warming room. So the enzyme that converts the DHA into MGO, so the DHA is the compound actively present in the, um, the nectar of the Manuka plant. We want to have that converted into MGO, which is the antibacterial compound. And that requires just a little bit of warmth. So no higher than 40 or 50 degrees Celsius. Um, so just get that little bit of warmth coming in. Too much heat will kill off some of those enzymes. And then we're having, again, an inferior product. So if we, again, we go back up to here, this HMF is something that they're using to determine has this honey already been heated if they're buying from another site. Honey is stitched and filtered and pumped into vats and it's creamed in vats. Again, this requires a little bit of heat just to help um, move things around. So we end up with a very sort of consistent, uniform texture. Gets packed into jars do the quality testing and look at exactly how much MGO. And then that gets packed into cartons, stored in the warehouse. And then you've got your Manuka honey, put that fingerprint QR code on top, and then it's ready for you guys to consume. So temperature is tightly controlled to protect the honey. There you go, Manuka Health's governance, collective expertise from land to hive to shelf ensures utmost quality and product integrity. There we go, unique natural properties. It does have a wonderful texture and it tastes so rich and delicious too. So highest quality standards. They have lots of accreditations. Uh, the jars are BPA free, kosher, uh, non-GMO. So, you know, all these, these checks and balances along the way. Manuka honey is, their Manuka honey is 100% natural product. It's unpasteurized. So again, we're looking at that warming is just enough to sort of get the enzymes where we want them to be and cream it but we're not pasteurizing and not putting it so high that it's killing off um, any of the good stuff that's in there. Slight differences in color and texture can absolutely occur from batch to batch and over time. So I'll you know, buy a jar when I run out and it tastes and looks a certain way. And then we'll go through it as colds come up. I have two small kids, giving Manuka honey to them is so easy, right? A little spoonful and they get the suck it and then swallow that down, soothe their throat. Tastes good, everyone's happy but it does change over time. That color can, can deepen. So in general, the higher the MGO level, the deeper the flavor of the color, the more it tastes like Manuka versus regular honey. The color of the honey can also change naturally due to storage conditions and age, kind of like a fine wine. It's growing in flavor and darkening in color with age. So 100% New Zealand origin, traceable right back to the beekeeper it came from, and you can get that from the QR code, pure and unpasteurized, and then triple tested for quality, purity, and MGO potency. So how to enjoy it straight from the spoon. This is what I do with my kids. You can dilute it in water. Um, you know, that's sort of that classic toddy of, you know, honey, lemon, ginger, and then the boiling water on top. I don't do that with the Manuka. I don't know if hundred degrees Celsius for a short period of time, and then it starts to cool is enough to damage the constituents in it. Um, but I just generally don't. So I, I put in a bit of sort of cooler water first and try to make a bit of like a slurry. So it's got that cooler temperature. It, it doesn't completely mix in. Then when I add the hot water, it takes it from cool to sort of maybe a little bit more than drinkable, like the sippable, but it's not going like scalded with super hot water right to begin with. And you can mix it into just um, cool to moderately warm water and use it as like your pre-workout energizer or post-workout recovery. So great for exercise. You're getting that sort of easy carb load and then your immune system, which can get taxed during exercise because exercise is a stress. It's a good stress, but it's a stress. Um, we want to help with that recovery on the other side. Great as a sweetener into your coffee. Again, I, I don't know, I maybe do the multi-floral, um, but if I was going to be spending the, the primo dollars on the, the, the high MGO, I don't think I'd be putting it in hot liquids. Add to smoothies, absolutely. Drizzle over breakfast. It is delicious. And then face mask, body scrubs. I have mine in a little like, sample jar and I'll use that for for any sort of topical wounds. Typically it's one teaspoon one to three times a day. It kind of depends why you're taking it. Um, moderate 
glycemic index of 54 to 59. So diabetics can still take it, but they probably want to have some protein and fat in their bellies first. So other ways to bring it in, yeah, take a spoonful before your workout. So you go the extra mile, replace your carbonated energy drink with Manuka honey, spread it on toast, replace the sugar and tea for a refreshing energy lift. Lovely cleansing tonic. So again, that, that, that toddy. So we can do this as just like your morning hot water with lemon. You can put some Manuka in there as well and get that antimicrobial effect. So particularly cold and flu season, if you or anyone else in your family is struggling with an infection, it'd be a good time to, to bring in the manuka. Yeah. Yeah. So for kids, any honey is not recommended for children under 12 months of age, pasteurized or unpasteurized. At least if it was pasteurized, there's a chance that it could kill off spores, but botulism spores are heat resistant. Like canning high pressure heat won't kill a botulism spore. So no child until their first birthday gets to have honey. After they've passed that year mark, then it's easy, you know, add it to the oatmeal straight off the spoon, although then they can get quite um, um, appreciative of a straight sugary source. So I generally mix it in with something that's going to dilute that sweetness and the kids don't get totally, I want more everything that just tastes like fully, fully sweet. Great source of sustained energy for growing kids. Great for cough suppressants and sore throats. This were also like for my kids. Maybe they get sore throats more than they get coughs, but you know, getting that on there just to like really help soothe. And I encourage them not to like put the whole thing in their mouth and just like chunk it down, but like really kind of like lick it, and move it around your mouth, like really kind of get that long, slow release and, and prolonged exposure. Provides a number of essential vitamins and minerals in a very simple and tasty way. Choke free, right? We're not worried about them um, because it does dissolve. Some kids are allergic to bee products. This would not be um, a great option for them. So we want to use, same for adults, right? We want to use some, some common sense safety there as well. So which one do you choose? You go into the store, you got five options on the shelf. The MGO 30 plus, this is your gourmet. It tastes good. It's a little bit more of a richer, warmer Manuka honey flavor than your, your plain old honey. And you are getting at least a little bump of that antibacterial effect. The 115 and the 263 plus, this gives them that unique manuka, unique manuka factor rating of six or of 10. Just great overall. These are the ones I tend to have in my home, um, kids circulating, daycare, elementary school, getting ill, right? A little bit of, of manuka honey also kind of fits my pocketbook, but really all we're dealing with are some dry throats, some coughs, me, like, you know, a cold sore or you know, the occasional pimple or something. That's great to have that, that level. It gets a lot more expensive, but also a lot more potent when we get up to the 400 and the 573 plus. This, I think, is where we'd be looking at if like, oh, you've got an ulcer from H. pylori. You know, maybe let, let's spend the money and get the, the UMF 16 or the, the MGO 573. And so the plus really means that at least 573 milligrams per kilogram. There might be 600. There might you know, be 615. We don't know. But at the very least, the guarantee is there'll be at least 500. 73. So if you're really dealing with lesions, erosion, um, you know, possibly you've had GERD for so long and there's been so much acid splashing up on your esophagus that, you know, the, the tissue's kind of eroded, it's it's raw, it's damaged, and we want to get anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial, um, and antioxidant properties on there and help that tissue to heal, then I'd, I'd be, be spending and going up to the, the higher one. Acne, um, particularly if it's like bad, like your red pustules um right so there's there's mild acne where you're getting a few pimples moderate where like it's a few more the severe is like it's it tends to be very infected the whole face or arm where, where area is red the back whatever it might be so that would be the one to put it on or really bad eczema i right? put it on that um and then just rest there's no studies that i found on using it as a topical so 15 minutes 20 minutes you know just enough put on a an, an audible or a podcast or something just relax get cucumber slices you know make a, a routine out of it um, but give it just that time to really sink in as best as you can and then conveniently there are also lozenges and they are coming in at the 400 plus so your daily dose for a manuka health lozenge is just one per day so the things i tend to keep on hand you know if someone in my family gets sick it happens I, I pop one of those and then like it's that immediate oomph getting right on the throat these are not ones obviously you give to kids because they could choke or really little kids, not my daughter, my son could handle it. Um, so we've got, there's a lemon one, a ginger one. Um, and then this one has propolis. So again, that really 
potent antibacterial resin that is found in a beehive. So a little bit, you've got your strong MGO 400, but you're also getting propolis in it. So really good if you've got like a bad throat, maybe a strep throat, like a super bad throat, go for that one. And though I did some flavor preference, I like the ginger, they're a little bit too spicy for my kids. They like the lemon or my kid, the older one. Um, so they're great for calming and soothing, dry, scratchy throat, instant relief that lasts. I mean, I'm not sick right now, but I can tell just from talking, my voice is starting to go a bit funny. So I'll probably have a little manuka when I'm done here just to get that antioxidant, humectant, emollient, soothing property in there. <clears throat> so the added uh, benefit of a little bit of vitamin C. And then there is some sugar in there. Otherwise it would just be runny honey. So there's some sugar there. So it does crystallize into a lozenge itself. Um, but no artificial colors, flavors, gluten-free, nut-free, suitable for vegetarians. Honey obviously is not suitable for vegan at any form. Um, measurable MGMO levels. And again, the higher one, right? We go up, boom. The lozenge is in this range. It's in your special care as opposed to your extra care or your daily care. So common questions. I'm gonna anticipate some of your questions. Um, do they test for glyphosate residue? So glyphosate being Roundup, uh, the um, herbicide that is sprayed on a lot of crops, they do check for, her for um, glyphosate and each and every batch, making sure that the manuka honey is tested. The ratio of glucose to fructose. This was a question that I asked. I treat a lot of digestive issues and you know some people have a fructose intolerance. So if they get a honey that's 50-50 glucose fructose, they tend to be able to tolerate it quite well. If it's imbalanced, then they might have bloating, so small intestine bacterial overgrowth. So we don't use Manuka for that. Is all Manuka honey available for sale outside of New Zealand regulated by the MPI, the Ministry of Primary Industries? And it's yes. Other companies will be certified by MPI. However, if they don't test for it or list the MGO content and are not certified by UMF, there's no guarantee what level of MGO is in the final product. So all Manuka honey is MPI, not all of them MGO. We really want to promote the MGO because it has the research behind it. Does the honey contain antibiotics or additives such as sugar? Nothing else is added. It's just the Manuka honey. Um, it's been tested for contaminants, toxins, GMO, heat damage, added sugars. And so make sure we're getting the purity, quality, and food safety parameters. So what you're looking for, step one, does it come from New Zealand? If it's Manuka honey, it says Manuka honey on the label and it comes from any country other than New Zealand, even Australia, which is right next door, it doesn't count. It only comes from New Zealand. Um, exported must pass strict government standards. You wanna look for the methyl glyoxal content that will tell you how strong it is and therefore where you wanna be spending your dollars. If you just need a little bit of overall support or if you have actual damage that you really need to try and fix. MGO is that natural compound that gives Manuka honey its unique potency and is naturally formed in the honey from the Manuka nectar that contains the DHA. And then the next thing to look for would be the unique Manuka factor, your UMF rating, because it is a trusted system. It's something that, it's a standard. And so when people are producing according to that standard, then it becomes unified and we can understand where it's coming from and how it's being made. This gives a bit more depth of understanding into behind that product. Manuka Health pioneered the MGO rating system and they are members of the UMF Honey Association. So other rating systems, they just you, you can't compare apples to oranges. It might be strong, it might be weak. You don't know unless you have that MGO level right on there. So Manuka Health means extraordinary care and the highest standards, 100% New Zealand origin from these skilled bushkeepers um, in dense isolated Manuka bush. I think they must be very happy. Certified levels of methyl glyoxal specified on the product label gives you customer assurance and quality of grade. Traceable guarantee from bee beekeeper to jar using that QR code that's on top. Expert extraction in their in-house extraction facility, expert management and storage, keeping it at the temperature that we want, in-house drum warehouse, in-house processing for their customized temperature controlled honey. So again, we're seeing that temperature regulation really ties in. If it gets too hot, it's gonna become less potent. And so they're looking at that HMF rating, making sure that it's 40 or less. We wanna get that smooth velvety honey with all of its natural properties, properties and then testing every batch multiple times to ensure the quality and grade for that entire shelf life. And look at that beautiful image. We could all, oh, I don't know if we all wanna go visit there, we'll probably taint it, but it'd be nice to visit there at some point. Okay, so I am going to get into, I'll do the chats first and the Q and A's after. People can hear me, that's good. Someone heard putting honey in hot water destroys its benefits. It 
could well be. So that, yeah, that is my concern there. So put in some cool water first. And then when you add the hot water, it's going to go from, you know, whatever, five degrees Celsius up to, you know, 90 to 95, as opposed to scalding it with 100% fresh rolling boil heat. I wouldn't do that. Does Manuka honey spike blood glucose? So yeah, it's got that glycemic rating of about 55, 59. So yeah, it's a sugar. It has glucose and fructose in it. It will affect our blood sugar levels. So if blood sugar is an issue for you, make sure you've got protein, fat, fiber in your belly first. Don't do it on an empty stomach because then you've got that full ability to just suck it all into the bloodstream. Should it be avoided during candida or SIBO protocol? So candida came up the last time I did this talk. There's no evidence that Manuka has any benefit on candida at all. It breaks down bacterial biofilms, but not fungal biofilms. Um, so avoid it during candida just because it's sweet. It's not going to do any benefit and the sugars could um, feed that yeast. And avoid during SIBO protocol. It might have a 50-50 ratio. It might be great, but I don't know. So I avoid it when I'm treating my SIBO patients. How do they deal with the mites that the bees are subject to? I do not know. Um, so I'm trying to think, because normally there's like a sales rep and then we can sort of figure out how we're gonna get the answers. Um, I will get the answers, get the Healthy Planet sales rep those answers. And then I don't know who you follow up with at Healthy Planet. Um, I'll put my email in the chat box. Oh, there you go. Someone put their questions in the Q&A. I don't know how they deal with the mites. On a side note, if you have you have um, Fantastic Fungi on Netflix, Paul Stamets, Post Defense, Medicinal Mushrooms, and he's come up with a mushroom blend that helps to protect um, the honeybees from the, is it the Varroa mites. Yes, so pretty cool. I don't know if they use mushrooms, but I think they should. Uh, questions in the Q&A. Have you had success treating a client with Manuka only without other antimicrobial I haven't used it on its own um it's always it's part of a routine it's one more thing they can try you get coughs and colds a lot have this but yes still take your ginger echinacea medicinal mushrooms zinc vitamin c so I, I don't ever use it on its own so no I've not had success but that doesn't mean it wouldn't be successful on its own do the New Zealand mites bees get the varroa mite I don't know I have a note to learn about mites in New Zealand what is the varroa mite? The varroa mite carries um, lacewing disease. And so it, um, you know, the, the bees are flooding around and they're picking up contaminants, just like we're moving around and we're touching different contaminants at different times. And then those mites can release the virus that um, causes their wings to deteriorate. And then they have lacewing disease and then they just can't fly very far. They're not able to pollinate as broad an area. And it's part of what is killing the, the pollinators, part of, part of the issue with the pollinators. Does Manuka honey expire or just get stronger? Do you suggest Manuka honey for the elderly, especially those in a senior's home? It doesn't expire. It will continue to get stronger for about four years. So there's DHA in the uh, nectar, and then that gets converted to MGO, gets converted to MGO, gets converted, and eventually it just plateaus and it just kind of hit that point. So if you have an old Manuka honey, it's probably more potent than when you first bought it. If it's more than four years old, it's, it's maxed out. So it's still good. Um, use it for the elderly. It could be helpful for like bed sores, um, right? If they're not moving around very much and they're getting kind of those erosions under the, the pressure points, that could be a helpful way of, of putting that on and, and then putting a bandage over top of that. Otherwise, yeah, yeah just a good sort of antimicrobial, nice nutritional benefit for anyone, but not specifically. Okay, so that's the chat box done. Oh, one more chat just popped up. Best way to store the honey once it's been opened. A shelf is fine. A shelf is totally fine. Close chat, open Q&A, scroll up. My throat sometimes gets hoarse after I have my smoothie in the morning. Use the same ingredients for a long time, only started recently. Will it help this and how should I use it? Don't know. There's a couple things that could be going on with that. There could be a sensitivity to one of the foods in the smoothie. Um, there could be some silent reflux where you're like, I don't have reflux. I don't feel any burning, but it's there. Um, so I don't know. It might help. It might not. Can't, can't tell you. Daughter has gastro problems from Lyme disease antibiotics. Could this help her? You can use it long term. Again, if it's upper GI, it should be helpful. If it's lower GI, probably not because our own digestive juices are going to break things down and um, deactivate it 
as it passes through the digestive tract. So gastro problems is a big, broad thing. If it's reflux, could be helpful. If it's lower in the GI, probably not. Um, there's one, is there one from, there's a Manuka honey from Australia. Is it real Manuka honey? If it's coming from Australia, it legally and technically can't be called Manuka. That's so proprietary to New Zealand. Um, I'm not familiar with the brand, but I will make a note and look it up and see what I think about it. One of those things, like you, when you know something, you just you stick with what you know and what works. Um, macrobiotic view. I don't know enough about macrobiotic uh, diet. But the macrobiotic view is we should use what grows near us. Since we live in Canada and our bees hover near buckwheat, clover, and wildflowers, is our honey better for us than manuka? Potentially from like a seasonal allergy point of view, you know, if we get exposed to the pollens in our community, we tend to have sort of that additional desensitization to it, but ours don't have the MGO in it. So if you're trying to heal a bad sore throat or a gastrointestinal ulcer or put it on your, your skin and you need a bit more oomph, um, then not necessarily. So. Has anyone ever measured the manure against our honey here? Our honey, because we don't grow these species of trees that contain this particular compound called DHA that gets converted into MGO. Um, so I, I don't know of any studies that are done to that degree. It was only because Manuka really stood out as being uniquely medicinal. All honey, as I said, has hydrogen peroxide. So all honey has some degree of medicinal benefit. Um, but to look at individual honeys when there isn't sort of that mm, testimonial behind it, I don't think anyone's gonna be spending that money. Right, New Zealand put that money in because like there's something going on here. And now they have a marketable product. Why is it so expensive? Is it because of import duties or is it marketing advertising? There is one small remote corner of the world where these trees bloom for six to eight weeks a year. So it's it's I think it's a supply and demand thing. There's only so much honey that can come out of North Island, New Zealand, and as manuka becomes more popular, more people want it. That drives the price up. So I don't know if it's import duties or market or advertising so much and it's just supply and demand go over the numbers again of the potencies okay i'll do that after how do you consume it for GERD you can do straight off the spoon i've heard some people say take it every day to treat existing issues but also as a preventative how much so this is where the studies are kind of lacking because it is not a drug it is a food it is marketed as a food it is sold as a food and so that's where we're like, yeah, people take one to three teaspoons a day. Um, and there isn't really a hard and fast, you need this much. If you have GERD, you need to take it for four weeks or eight weeks. And only, you know, so they're like the, the studies just aren't there. Um, how much should you take each day? Yeah, one to three teaspoons, empty stomach, or can it be mixed in food like oatmeal? It can be mixed in food. I just wouldn't heat it up. Any research on cancer prevention? Not that I saw. Um, again, it needs to come into contact with the wound. So. If there was like a skin cancer, that would be an interesting study. I didn't see it when I was looking through. I also wasn't specifically searching for it. Um, but if it's like a prostate cancer or breast cancer, then I there wouldn't be because the manuka is not going to get into contact with that. So it's more antimicrobial than anti-carcinogenic. So I'm going to say no on the cancer front. Possible to have a copy of the slides? Um, probably. Again, I'm just the educator. I get hired to come and talk for an hour and then... Um, I, I'll run it past the rep. Um, I know, how about, okay, let me, let's finish doing the questions. Severe gum disease, taking a spoonful of honey, can it slow down the progression of the disease? Probably, that fits with the, it's coming into, into contact with that, it's anti-inflammatory, it's antimicrobial. That said, I don't think there's any studies. So it would be a, a, a good one to add in while doing everything else. Um, that you're going to be doing for severe gum disease. How uh, will it affect blood sugar? Again, glycemic ratio or glycemic index. Can it help with IBS? Probably not. Is it important to use a wooden spoon? I was told it reacted to silverware or other types of metals. I do not know. I will look into that. Um, recently had braces. Is this good to help with their oral care? Again, possibly. Um, Right. If, if there's like irritation happening inside the gums from that, then the, moving the manuka around, try and heal that up and then brushing the teeth well before bed. So I would do that, move the manuka honey, like around the mouth, get into contact with any wounded gum areas 
and then wait 20 minutes, half an hour, like give it time to kind of sit in there. Don't swallow it all down. Um, and then brush teeth later, sorry. Trying to talk and read at the same time, it doesn't work. Uh, some Manuka honey I bought, it doesn't have an NGO content on the jar. It just notes platinum, it says Manuka health on it. Yeah, so that was their old rating. I think it just did have a UMS on it. Um, so platinum was their extreme, what they now call the 573 plus. So it was multi-floral and then there was bronze, silver, gold and platinum. Um, but that would be quite old, I would think. They changed the MGO rating years ago. Uh, using a common silver spoon effect microbial. Uh, yeah, I do not know. The silver versus wooden spoon thing. I don't know, but I will look it up. Once you open the jar, does it go in the fridge? Nope, not necessary. Um, recently started a keto diet. Was told to avoid all forms of sweeteners. Can this be an exception? It is still a sweetener, so it is going to go against keto. It's going to pop you out of ketogenic fasting mode. Um, but if you have GERD or a sore throat, right, you're gonna have to sort of play with that, but it doesn't fit a keto. Can you take it while pregnant? Yep. The only contraindication for honey is if you have an allergy or if it, you're zero to 12 months old. Um, wetter spoon, organic, now only called Manuka honey. So that's another one. So that, that's the company that I think that does the, the K rating and doesn't do MGO. So I don't, I don't know enough about them. So I'm going to be looking up the other brand that somebody mentioned. Wetterspoon, I know, doesn't put MGO on it. Uh, so I, I just can't comment on how potent it is or isn't. How does honey contain hydrogen peroxide? It's part of the um, production. It's part of the, the fermentation from the nectar in the hive. It's, it's the natural process of how honey is made. Hydrogen peroxide is, is part of that, and it eventually does break down um, over time. In the lozenges, the ingredients say natural lemon oil. Would that be D-limonene? Do not know. I don't think so. I think lemon oil would be less expensive. It's just a flavoring. It's not in there as a, as a medicinal agent. So I think it was just natural lemon oil like you would use in you know, baking kind of thing. Uh, it can actually cause harm if added into really liquid. Something about it becoming poisonous. I don't know. I don't know. Is the DHA you mentioned the same DHA related to omega-3? It is not. So omega-3 ah see i'm always going straight to the omega-3 one so today i purposely programmed into my brain dihydroacetone um no it is not the hydroacetone is a compound that gets converted to ngo it is not fatty based it is not fatty related um so no it's a different dha and that just makes things all the more confusing how long before it expires um uh, it doesn't expire per se. It's not going to go off. It's just going to sort of plateau. So like honey doesn't really go bad. It's part of how they've found old, old stuff. Okay, back to the chat. Do, do, do. Oh, so some of these were sort of doubled up. I don't know what Costco sells. How important is it to keep the honey tightly sealed? I'm, I don't know. I don't know. I know it is not the same as omega-3. Answer that one. How is it for the liver? Um, any sugar can cause issues with the liver long-term. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is related to fructose. Um, so monitor your blood sugars overall, but otherwise Manuka isn't going to directly affect the liver because it has to be digested, taken up into the bloodstream, and Manuka has its benefit coming into contact with things. All right, so could... <laughs> Um, the, see, I'm just trying to figure out how I'm going to get you guys your answers. Um, trainings at tallgrass.ca. I'm going to put that in there. So in the chat, there is an email address. So if you have a specific question that you asked me that I can't answer specifically the Varroa mites the brand of Manuka honey that has a Canadian name it's called Capilano I got it um, if you can send an email I will get those answers as quickly as I can I will let Lucy know and then she can give you the answers but give me a couple days um yeah and we'll find out that so you'd all 
I like the answers. Uh, yeah, I don't know how to post that. So I think email address. So I put it in there. It's in the chat box. Trainings. It was posted at exactly five. There was a comment at 458. Me to host and panelists. Am I not sharing with everyone? Sorry. There we go. I shared the email with myself and I already know it. Boom. There is the email posted at 501. And I will get those answers not by tomorrow morning, but as soon as I can. And I'll get them out to Lucy so that when you guys ask her questions, because the other thing, we, like I'm in DC, you guys are in Ontario, I believe. Um, so when we get questions we don't know the answers to, we learn the answer and then everyone knows it and answers our frequently asked question. Maybe ask Health Planet to email us the answers the same way they emailed us the invite. I can try that. Email answers via Zoom registration. That makes sense. Zoom. Okay. First, I will get those answers and then we will go from there. So you guys have options. You can email in. I will send them out to the rep who can send them to Healthy Planet, who can then get them out to you through the Zoom and we'll go from there. All right. Thank you so much for joining um, and have a wonderful evening. Right. Take care, everyone.